Alright guys, such going to be back again today. Hope you're enjoying your Tuesday so far. Today we're going to talk about Pac-Man and Optic Gaming released from the team as their head coach. Now no longer with Optic Gaming. Why exactly has this happened? What could Optic Gaming be doing further forward? And of course, it's a pretty interesting timing, right? Given that they've just had their best performance of the season, making the grand finals of the Florida Home Series. But Pac-Man no longer with them. Many things to discuss here. So like if you guys enjoyed the video, subscribe if you are new. As always, I would greatly appreciate that. Thanks for the love on yesterday's video as well. We are rapidly closing in on 19,000 subscribers I'm thinking that like if I can get to 20,000 subs on this channel by the end of the season that'll be really impressive and I'll be really proud of what we've achieved here on the channel if that's the case so Let's move on with things. Rallied, obviously, also released on Optic Gaming, as you can see on screen. And this does pose a question of the interesting timing of this move. If Pac-Man was just released on his own, the, the big question would be, okay, I guess the team just didn't think he was valuable. But with Rally being released at the same time, it does kind of imply that there is some cost-cutting exercise going on here. Rallied, of course, being with Optic Gaming when Hector was still on the team. Then the whole sale situation went down. Immortals then picked up Optic Gaming. And now Rally has since been released as like a content creator kind of situation. Probably, in this case, a cost-cutting exercise. But then we have this from Opta Gaming. We'd like to thank Pac-Man for his work with OGLA. We appreciate everything he's done for the squad and wish him the best going forwards. Thank you, Pac-Man. And he tweets out the following. So... These announcements coming concurrently, obviously pretty interesting. I'm no longer a part of Opta Gaming. I will miss being with the team on a daily basis, but my time here has come to an end. I've spent the last decade of my life in Call of Duty and will be looking for the next opportunity that arises for me in COD Esports. So... I have to see what goes on for Pac-Man going forwards. Of course, he was on the desk last season. Maybe that's an opportunity for him, but it seems like the desk is pretty much packed out at the moment. Um, you know, pun unintended. And as Clayster says in reply, you'll just make the final so That's pretty bad. Hope you land on your feet. We're looking for an analyst. So intriguing. If you guys are trying to be the analyst for the Empire, maybe hit him up. Um, Mutex apparently is uh, maybe not on the agenda this time. So who knows exactly what will happen with Pac-Man, but it's obviously a really interesting change especially given the context of they just did so well in this most recent event. So question is really, first of all, why has he been released from the team? Is it solely a cost-cutting exercise? But then again, you think if it's a cost-cutting exercise and Immortals are struggling for cash, League of Legends isn't as profitable as it should have been, the pandemic is obviously causing some issues. If that is the case, you're not going to get rid of someone who is providing value add to the team. I imagine that the squad and Opta Gaming doesn't feel like Pac-Man's particularly um, providing too much value to the squad, or they wouldn't just have released him in this situation. Obviously, it's a bit of both, right, I'd imagine. But there's some interesting discussion here on the Reddit that we'll just discuss real quick. Whether they think that with Chino going onto the starting lineup and Jacob onto the bench and having this good role, what exactly could have happened here? Because you could argue that Pac-Man was, let's say he was pro Jacob and he was happy for Jacob to be in the team. And he was pushing that with the squad. But then they decided to let's bring Chino in instead. And Jacob's going to move to the bench. And then they have their best results. That could be a reason why they think that Pac-Man doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's get rid of him. That's not that's an option, right? At the same time, you could argue that, look, Jacob's now on the bench. Pac-Man is head coach. We're already paying for Jacob to sit on the bench. Does it make sense just to have Jacob now as the coach, right? And we've got Marog as the kind of general manager that kind of knows COD as well. And maybe Pac-Man wasn't bringing as much to the table as maybe we expected. And Jacob could even do a better job at being a substitute already, maybe that's a better option than keeping Pac-Man on. So it could be a culmination of both things. So this is certainly an option right here. And um, yeah, watching J-Cab snake the coach slot since they have to pay him anyway. So yeah, who knows? And of course, the, uh, the whole money situation could be an option as well because it's obviously not looking great right now for esports organizations in general very few of them make a profit at all only really like 100 thieves phase clan possibly not too many other teams aside from that are really having a good turnover in esports right now especially given the difficulty this current situation has arisen with working from home and all the other shenanigans that happens if you're trying to run your business in this difficult climate so we're going to understand that but at the same time they're obviously going to release people who they think aren't adding too much to the whole immortals opt game brand right now so then also just wanted to quickly mention this from Tommy he pointed out to me that in Kenny's stream he mentioned the Pac-Man situation don't have a clip to go along with this unfortunately but you know basically Kenny was implying that can't really talk about it it was more of a team decision so that kind of um, supports the theory that there's two sides to the story here there's the cost-cutting side but there's also the side where the team or the general management or whatever decided that Pac-Man wasn't bringing too much to the table and maybe it happened to be that this um, this most recent result went against what Pac-Man 
kind of been saying and suggesting with the squads, and that was kind of the final, final nail in the coffin, rather than it being that Pac-Man was in, pro, in support of this Chino change, and it seems to have made a positive effect. But as I talked about, it's probably more of a mindset thing with this Opta Gaming team than anywhere else. So the question I wanted to delve into in the last few minutes of the video here is surrounding when we hold coaches accountable. It's a big question that's coming up. I did plan a video on this of, you know, a few days time. But of course, there's no better time to talk about it than now with Pac-Man being released from the Optic Gaming squad. So the question is, in a lot of normal sports, the coach is held pretty much accountable for a lot of issues, especially in the um, the European Premier, or you know, the English Premier League and in football, soccer, in general in Europe. If a team isn't doing so well, it's pretty widely considered that the coach is to blame. The players obviously have some role to play, but in a lot of traditional sports, the coach is considered to be a fundamental aspect of the team. Call of Duty, it's probably a slightly different situation. Here of course are the results from Opta Gaming so far this season. They've had a couple of decent spells at the LA Home Series and then most recently at the Florida one. But outside of that, it's been a pretty atrocious season for them so far and maybe it will get better from, you know, here on outright. But of course, who knows how much value the coach is having Call of Duty. I would argue, and I'll show you a clip real quick from the podcast a couple of weeks ago when Clayster was on, he was talking about the Seattle surge change with Panda coming into the squad, Enable in the team and all of this kind of situation. Enable on the bench, Panda, you know, when he said that Panda shouldn't be playing in the starting lineup and Enable should actually be in the starting lineup instead of Panda. He came along with that to say that, look, Joey Nubsey is the coach. What value does he add to the team? Can you hold him accountable for a change with so many good players in the squad? It doesn't work out right. So here we go. It's about two minutes. So when do we look at Nubsy being the problem for that team and not a player? That's true. I mean, did he make that decision? He probably most likely he did, right? I, yeah. I feel like he has a ton of control over rosters. I mean, well, even Gen G last year, you know? I so feel that's, like... Go ahead. You know, I just feel like, you know, if a team with those players, like, isn't performing well, and you drop a player and they're still not performing well, like, you know, what is... Like, what's the problem then? You know, we were really bad with Brian Saint towards the end of his tenure. Yep. We pick up Facento, become an immediately different team, although we did pick up Simp you at the same time. You picked up Simp at the same time. Nah, Bryce was a huge part of that. I'm, like, not, saying, I'm not saying that he wasn't, but you picked up Simp at the same time. Yeah. But I'm just – so exactly. So where is their opportunity to go get an amateur player and pick up a coach that can come in and straighten everybody out? And I'm not saying that Joey's a bad coach. I've never been coached by Joey. I don't know anything about how Joey coaches or his coaching style or any of that. I really don't. I just know Joey is a person. And so it's like I'm just asking the question, posing the question, when do you look at – you know, some of the best Call of Duty players of all time not performing, like so, what the reason is. So let me chime in here. So there's something I've been kind of wanting to talk about at some point in the year, but it's like, when does the community and players like start holding coaches accountable? Like in all sports and everything, coaches, GMs and everything, they're, a lot of them are held accountable, especially if they are part of the construct of the roster. And if they were given the opportunity and tools to make moves and a decision for the team that would make them better and it doesn't go well. So yeah, I mean, that's a great question. People haven't talked about that at all, but like, yeah, they made a move. And if he was at the core of that move and it hasn't panned out at all, it's like, yes, he should be held accountable as well as the players that were involved with it as well. Like it's just something that needs to be done. So yeah, uh, I think it is a good point to bring up. It's just hard for us to speak to it because we don't know like the moving parts of of the organization and the team. So a couple of comments on this one. Clayster, of course, talks about how for Sento on his team in the past was such an important influence for the United squad being very good. Of course, Crowder on the 100 Thieves team was largely considered to be a pretty important aspect as well. Of course, Crowder came in alongside Priester, um, as did, uh, well, for Sento and Simp on the squad right in the United. So who knows as to what impact they really had. Players probably have more impact. I do agree that the coaches, is probably a small element of what happens, right? But you could say, okay, let's say a coach can have a 20% impact on the performance of a team, maybe a 10%, maybe a 30%, whatever it is, in a positive direction. If a team isn't doing so good, you therefore have to logically say that a coach you know, playing, you know, performing badly, I suppose, making poor decisions, you know, having a poor coaching style and uh, affecting team chemistry in that aspect can also hurt a team by 10, 20, 30 percent or whatever you want to argue that they can on the positive side. But of course, it's very hard to, um, to justify these things in terms of quantitative analysis, right? How do you look at a team and say that, oh, Joey Nubsey is a minus 5 percent impact on the squad and his coaching style isn't helping? 
from the team. You can never realize that out apart from what the players say themselves. We don't have any info on the Seattle squad, but of course, you could argue that on the up to gaming squads, Pac-Man and the squad did not think he was adding anything beneficial to the team. Now, what Joey Nubsy says for this, uh, the Seattle Surge team, which of course have had a difficult time, right? Like they have Panda on the starting lineup now. Their home series is coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you guys are um, you know, not ready for that one, then it's coming up. Seattle are going to be playing in a couple of weekends time here. And we'll have to see how their squad does. As far as we understand, there's no change yet, or at least no change from the Panda lineup. And as Joey Nubsy says here on the Reddit, nothing but fair points were made here. That's um, in regards to Clayster's clip. Accountability is an important part of the job. And I promise I've held my myself and the team to a much higher standard than anyone else on this Reddit. I just hope to keep improving and show why my team has been considered an amazing group of players and what I really do bring to a team. More importantly, to bring some wins to the franchise and all the amazing supporters. But if I if I think if people could understand the logistics, it would make more sense. But I ha if I have to take the brunt of it for now, that is completely fair. So you know, Pac-Man never really got this um, this same indication. But of course, as Glacier was talking on that uh, episode right there, Pac-Man was of course on the Coldcast as one of the co-hosts, him and Nameless, you know, probably think get a similar thing, right? To what degree do I have to be accountable for poor results on the up to gaming team? And there's plenty of people in the past on the up to gaming team, for example, World War II last year and Black Ops 4 were holding TP to account and saying he was the issue with the squad. I don't think in that case he was the issue with the squad. I think there was more chemistry issues on the team. And as I say, I do think a coach is a minor part of the squad, but can have an at least a significant impact on how the team operates in terms of chemistry and analysis and uh, map vetoes and this kind of stuff. On the positive side, a coach can take a team from being a top four team, for example, to being a top two best team in the game, for example. But I just don't think that that's necessarily going to make an absolutely overwhelming difference. But on the negative end, you could say that a coach can also have a negative impact, right? If they can have a positive impact, they can also surely have a negative impact on the squad as well, I would argue. I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts in the comment section below here. What will Opta Gaming do going forwards? What do you think Pac-Man should do next in his career. Has Jcap got an opportunity potentially to step into the coaching role on this squad for the rest of the season? And would he ever rescind that ever? Is he just going to be a coach for the rest of his career? That's certainly a possibility as well. Is that what behind is that what is behind Opta Gaming's thinking? That is also possible. And if Seattle don't improve, to what degree do you hold Joey Nubsy account? Or do you just say that the players aren't as good as they once were? Which is certainly also a valid option, right? There's uh, many factors at play here. So like if you guys enjoyed the video, subscribe if you're new as always. I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.